If the recent extreme heat and weather has taught us anything, it's that the fundamentals are more important than ever. Understanding and applying fundamental gardening principles is what will help you be successful, especially when times get tough in the garden. And in today's video, I'm going to discuss four garden fundamentals that will help you have a healthy and productive garden. My name's Angela from Growing in the Garden. My garden is in Mesa, Arizona, Zone 9B, and I love sharing garden inspiration and helpful tips so you can be successful in your garden. The first key factor that you have to get right in order for your garden to be successful is the soil. What does healthy soil look like? It's light, fluffy, porous, it's full of life. It, there's fungi, bacteria, earthworms, and more. The fungi and bacteria are feeding on those nutrients in the soil and that is what feeds the roots of your plants. Plants' roots emit new food for the bacteria and fungi to eat and that's the circle of life or the soil food web. As you treat your soil right and use organic gardening principles, your soil will only get better and improve. How do you know how your soil is doing? Squeeze it. The soil should hold together but then break apart easily. Test your soil. Soil test kits are readily available and easy to use. They will give you a really good snapshot of what is going on with your soil pH levels and the mineral and nutrient levels in your soil. What can we do to improve our soil? Adding compost is going to make any soil better. Compost is also loaded with organic nutrients that are released slowly over time. It's like giving your plants a vitamin. It helps protect plants from diseases, it helps moderate the soil pH and support beneficial microorganisms. Another way to improve your soil is to add in-bed vermicomposting bins to your beds. If you followed me at all, you know that I love in-bed vermicomposting and I have added those bins to all of my beds. I wouldn't garden any other way. The worms break down the food scraps and create worm castings right in the garden bed where they're needed. What can worm castings do for your soil? Worm castings have powerful nutrients with minerals and good microorganisms. They're going to help improve pest and disease resistance. Those castings can be left in those bins or you can spread them around your bed. You can also add worm castings at the beginning of each season. Based on what your soil needs, you may need to add other forms of fertilizer. Always choose organic amendments. These amendments are going to feed the soil and then the soil will feed your plants. Use only as needed. It's better to use compost or worm castings instead of abundant amounts of fertilizer. What else can you do to improve the soil? Well, there are a few things you shouldn't do. You may have heard the term no dig or no till and there's a reason. Not tilling and not digging is better for your soil. Tilling can expose and destroy up to half of the organisms in the soil. It can destroy the microscopic pathways that are used by those microorganisms. It also can ruin your soil structure over time and it leaves the soil below the till line more compacted. The next fundamental principle is watering. Most problems in the garden can be traced back to incorrect watering, either too much or not enough. That's a lot of pressure to get this one right. Overwatering tends to be more of an issue than underwatering because we tend to love our plants too much and give them too much water. But plants' roots need air as well as water to breathe. Here are some signs that you might be overwatering. Not watering enough is also an issue, especially in very hot, dry conditions. It's not always easy to tell, but here are some signs to look for to know you are not watering enough. Here are a few key practices that you can implement to help you water correctly. Let the top inch or two of soil dry out before you water again. Don't water soil that's already wet. So stick a finger into the soil into your second knuckle. If the soil is still sticking to that finger, it doesn't need more water. Inconsistent watering, letting plants dry out too much, followed by too much water, is very stressful for plants. And plants that are stressed out are more prone to pests and diseases. Try to water in the morning. Watering early in the day helps keep plants hydrated before the daytime heat. 
Each time you water, you want to try and water the entire depth of that plant's root system, and that's gonna be different based on the size of plant that you're growing. Where watering can get a little bit tricky is that plants require more water when it is dry, windy, or in the summer heat. So plants don't always need the same amount of water all the time. During the summer in hot areas like Arizona, raised bed gardens often need watering every other day or every day. Other times of the year, that same garden bed may need water just once a week. So it's important to understand and adjust the frequency of watering for seasonal conditions. The next fundamental for your garden success is sunlight. All plants, especially flowering plants, need sunlight in order to grow well. And the sun's angle is going to change throughout the year. Evaluate your garden at different times of day throughout the year to understand how much sunlight your garden actually receives. And not all sunlight is the same. A garden that gets morning sun is going to do better than one that gets late afternoon sun choose morning sun if possible. The important thing to remember is that for most gardens, you're going to need at least six to eight hours of sun to grow a vegetable garden effectively. So wherever your garden is, make sure that it is getting enough sunlight. Fall and winter gardens, we're trying to maximize the sunlight. The days are cooler and shorter, and the sun's angle is lower, and that means that areas that were once in full sun may not receive as much sun. Less sun means slower growth in winter crops. An area that gets too much sun in the summer may be the perfect spot for your fall and winter garden. On the other hand, in the summer, often the problem is too much sun. And most plants are gonna benefit from some afternoon shade. And some plants are gonna grow well in full sun and others don't. Evaluate in your summer garden where it might be helpful to add some shade. And if you're gonna add shade, usually you wanna do it when temperatures are above 90 degrees. And then remove shade when temperatures have gone back down below 90 degrees. Adding shade can cool the area by about 10 degrees. And finally, timing. Timing is so crucial and that is part of what makes gardening so difficult because timing is different depending on where you live and what time of year it is. There's often not one right answer for everyone all over the world in regards to timing. Understand your current climate conditions. Try and make the most of your climate's benefits and then understand the challenges of where you live. For example, here in the low desert, extreme heat in the summer is definitely a challenge. On the other hand, we have almost ideal gardening temperatures many, many months of the year. And so it's important to maximize those times when gardens can grow well. So as you learn about the crops that you want to grow, you'll learn that each crop has a preferred growing temperature. Plants are happiest and grow best when they're planted at that ideal soil temperature and growing conditions. Warm season crops include things like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, melons, squash, eggplants, and sweet potatoes. Cool season crops include lettuce, onions, broccoli, beets, radishes, spinach, and cauliflower. Learn about the crops you want to grow and whether or not they're a warm season or a cool season crop. Another important part of understanding timing is to learn your first and last average frost dates. There are several websites online where you enter in your zip code and it gives you your average first and last frost date. So that gives you a general idea. On a smaller scale, be aware of your own yard's microclimate and conditions. So in your yard and in your garden, you're gonna have some areas that receive more sunlight that are typically warmer than other areas and parts of your garden are going to be naturally cooler. Those are microclimates. Pay attention to those spots in your yard that have a little bit cooler or a little bit warmer temperatures and then use those to maximize your growing season. Understanding microclimates, adding shade, or using frost cloth or hoop houses are ways to maximize your growing seasons. The best time to plant is going to vary greatly by region. So how do you find out when to plant? Well, ask experienced gardeners in your area. Instagram is great for this. There are a lot of regional gardeners that offer advice specific to where they live. You can also contact your local extension office. They often have planting guides that you can use. And local nurseries can be an excellent excellent resource for planting dates and other information. If you live here in the low desert, I have a planting guide and planting calendar that gives the approximate planting dates 
for many crops that you might want to grow. I'll link to it here. Understanding these key gardening fundamentals will help your garden survive and thrive. Thank you so much for watching.